Welcome, everybody. Welcome and good morning to everyone. This is the Nashville Civic Design Center's 2012 Living the Plan of Nashville Annual Luncheon. On behalf of our co-chairs, Donna Glassford and Chase Rind, welcome to all. I'm Larry Papel, and I have the pleasure this year of serving as the board chair for the Nashville Civic Design Center. We appreciate your attendance and support of the Di Design Center more than you know. We honor that support with a program today that will update you on everything that the Design Center is currently working on, some plans for the future, uh, and of course, with Dick Jackson's remarks on designing healthy communities. Uh, this is a topic very much on the agenda of Nashville's governmental, health care, and development leaders. But first, let's take care of a little business. This event would not be possible without the very generous support of our sponsors. Please note the sponsor names and logos displayed on the screens on either side of this room, on the table cards, and on, in your program. Special thanks to our Keystone sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Middle Tennessee, the Scott C. Chambers Fund, Nashville Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, One City and Healthcare REIT, Smith Sackman Reed, Earl Swenson Associates, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and Village Real Estate Services. Uh, and also to our Cornerstone sponsors, Bradley Arant, Bulk Cummings, J.E. Dunn Construction, Gresham Smith Partners, Hastings Architecture Associates, Stites and Harbison, Tennessee State University, and Vanderbilt University. There are also other sponsors listed in your program. Uh, please note those. You'll also see some ribbons on certain name tags. Those designate our sponsors, so thank the sponsors as you see them. We also want to recognize a very special partner and sponsor of the Design Center, the University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design, uh, which for more than 10 years has provided key support and guidance. Uh, with us today are two of the Design Center's past design directors, and I'm going to ask them both to stand and be recognized, Mark Schimenti and T.K. Davis. Thank you both for your steadfast support of the Design Center and the Nashville-based studio work that forms a part of the architecture school's curriculum. Uh, the students are in and out of Nashville all the time, and it's a great energy and thought process. The Design Center also receives critical government support. Uh, today with us, and I'm sorry if I miss anybody, we have Mayor Carl Dean of Metro, we have Mayor Ken, Ken Wilbur from Portland, Tennessee. We have several Metro Council members, Berkeley Allen, Fabian Bedney, Peter Westerholm, and Ronnie Stein. Um, and we also have Dr. Bill Paul, Director of Metro's Public Health Department. Thank you to all that you do to support the Design Center. We also have many past and current Design Center board members. Uh, it's a big group. Will all of you stand and be recognized, please? There we go. The Design Center was founded in 2000, and I know I just missed somebody. Bill Purcell was mayor at the time. He's sitting over on this side of the room. Uh, and, it con and the Design Center continues to promote good design and the importance of citizen input in projects throughout Nashville-Davidson County and indeed beyond. Uh, it has expanded its reach through publications, programs, juried competitions, consultancies, consultancies documentaries, partnerships, and speaker series. Uh, the Design Center's tagline is Design Matters which is certainly true, but probably suggests far more than its simple two words. Uh, does it mean smart growth, policy and design, 
change matters. Those are things we all need to be exploring all the time. And I think we're going to explore some of those today in a thoughtful way. The design center has become a model for other design centers around the country. Uh, our staff often consults with design centers, new and established, in other cities. It's a thought leader in an expanding sphere of influence. Uh, it, this design center matters, in other words. It's an effective advocate for thought growth and design. Uh, I encourage you all in the near future to, to visit the Designing Action Design Competition finalist display that are, are up uh, outside at the trolley barns on Rolling Mill Hill. The exhibition is a dynamic, is dynamic, it showcases ideas, some pretty unsurprising and some pretty far out there about how an East Bank development might look sometime in the future. Uh, you can even vote uh, for the People's Choice Award uh, uh, for those exhibitions, and I hope you'll do that before the exhibition comes down on, on October 15th, which is just next week. And enough for me. First up on the, our program is Gary Gaston, our design director, who will update you on current programs and plans and demonstrate some of the ways that this design center is, and our city is indeed living the plan of Nashville. Gary? Thank you, Larry. And I uh, just want to welcome everyone again for attending this, the uh, annual luncheon of the Nashville Civic Design Center. This event gives us the opportunity to showcase the work that we've been doing over the past year. And I have to tell you, it's been a very busy year for us. A quick version goes like this. We premiered a documentary film, published a major new book, unveiled an international design competition, hosted over 30 monthly programs, offered 14 internships and four fellowships, partnered with the University of Tennessee to conduct five design studios, worked with four Vanderbilt University classes on research and analysis projects, sponsored a day of turning 10 parking spaces into parks, and collectively served on over eight committees within the community. Take a breath now. But here's a brief overview of some of the work that we've been doing over the past year. Design Your Neighborhood is our National Endowment for the Arts funded documentary film that follows a group of 14 inner city teenagers for four weeks during a summer design camp. It portrays the many ways in which design can empower and transform youth. The film premiered in January and was shown at the Nashville Film Festival in April. Copies were sent to all high schools in Tennessee to serve as a resource to educators and career counselors for youth that may have an interest in design. Recently, we followed up with a few of the participants from the Design Your Neighborhood film one year after the program ended to see what they were up to and how the program has impacted their lives. And I'm happy to say that the four minute clip of these interviews is available to watch on our uh, website. It's very impressive. Moving Tennessee Forward is a beautiful 325 page book devoted to visionary ideas focused on transportation and land use that serves as a model for communities of all sizes across Tennessee. This book, funded by the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the Metropolitan Planning Organization, is being used extensively to promote the benefits of mass transit, economic development associated with transportation infrastructure, and thoughtful design as components of creating vibrant, livable communities. Designing Action is an international ideas competition sponsored by a National Endowment for the Arts grant to envision the many ways infrastructure that promotes active, healthy living can accomplish Nashville's desire to become the healthiest city in the Southeast. The Design Center proposed the east bank of the Cumberland River as the focus site for the competition. We received 136 entries from around the world, representing 39 countries on six continents. The exhibition was unveiled two weeks ago on Rolling Mill Hill. If you've not had a chance to see it yet, please take the time to do so and vote for your favorite entry. We will be announcing the People's Choice a winner at the end of the exhibit, which comes down next week. 
The Civic Design's partnership with the University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design continues to provide an incredible catalyst for promoting innovative design ideas for new projects in Nashville. Associate Professor and former Design Director T.K. Davis is now in his 10th semester of teaching design studio classes that focus exclusively on Nashville. The work connects out-of-the-box student imagination with real-world ideas for improving the urban design character of Nashville. On Friday, we will release Urban Infill Concepts along Nashville's East-West Connector, a study that features TK's student design work from this past spring semester. This partnership is made possible for the, through the ongoing support and financial contributions of the Metropolitan Planning Organization. This fall, the Design Center is also working with UT faculty members Bill Martella and Bob French on the design of a new crew boathouse located along the Cumberland Riverfront. Student designs for this exciting project will be displayed in Nashville at the end of this semester. Parking Day is an international event that is hosted every September in cities around the world to promote public space by transforming metered parking spaces into temporary public parks. Just a few weeks ago, the Design Center organized this event for the first time in Nashville. The day was supported financially by the Downtown Partnership and spaces were don donated by Public Works. Several metro departments and local design firms participated in this fun and whimsical event. Parking Day shows that even the tiniest of places can, be a huge, can play a huge role in adding to vibrancy of our cities. And finally, our Shaping Healthy Communities project is the focus of our work as we move into the upcoming year. This successful partnership with the Metro Public Health Department presents Nashville as a case study, focusing on the interconnected relationships between our city's overall health and the quality of its built environment. The resulting plan will be published by Vanderbilt University Press late next spring and will weave together all the different built environment aspects that help create a healthy city. The plan will be used to inform the Metro Planning Department's update of the general plan, which is currently underway, and we will open an exhibit at the Downtown Public Library on the topic of public health and the built environment in January of 2013. So in conclusion, as you can see, it has been a very busy and productive year for us at the Nashville Civic Design Center. We're thrilled to be doing the work that we do, and also I want you, all of you to know that we could not be doing it without your support and your generous financial backing. So once again, thank you all for coming. So this is uh, my favorite part of the year. I always get the chance to introduce the mayor of our great city, uh, Mayor Carl Dean. Your support and leadership of the critical issues related to the built environment have played such an important role in making Nashville one of the hottest cities in the country. Thank you for being here today. Please help me welcome the Honorable Mayor Carl Dean. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here today to celebrate a healthy vision for Nashville. And thank you to the Nashville Civic Design Center and all of its partners for the work you have done creating and living the plan of Nashville, as well as the great work you have done on shaping healthy community project in partnership with our health department. Now, the health of our city is very important to me as it is to all of you. Our city and our country are facing some dire health statistics. The rate of obesity in the United States has skyrocketed in recent decades, which is not, enjoy your dessert. Just disregard what I'm gonna say, but the, 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 I'm, I'm gonna, believe me, I'm gonna eat mine. Uh, we have had some good news recently about the obesity rate in Tennessee dropping. But when your good news is that your state is now out of the top 10 most obese states in the country, you know you still have a lot of work to do. Nearly 30% of Tennesseans are obese. Even more troubling here in Nashville, 38% of our youth are obese or overweight. Healthy eating and active living is the answer and it's something I'm gonna keep working on as long as I'm mayor. 
If this were any other health issue, like the flu, it would be viewed as an epidemic and the entire country would be focused on finding solutions. To be clear, this is not an issue of how people look in their clothes. It's about the direct link between obesity and the increased risk of heart disease and diabetes and even some form of cancers. Some say health is an issue of personal choice, and I believe that is true. But I also believe government plays an important role in making healthy choices available to people. It is my goal to make Nashville a city where the healthy choice becomes the easy choice. This includes making changes to our built environment where sidewalks, greenways, bike lanes, and places to play are easily accessible to all of our residents. Since taking office, we have invested over $130 million in public infrastructure to promote healthy, active living, which has included not only sidewalks and bikeways, but community centers, parks, multimodal streets, and public health facilities. A great example of public infrastructure supporting healthy living is a complete street. In 2010, I signed a complete street executive order to require the consideration of all modes of transportation in the planning, design, and construction of roadways in our city to make it easier for people who want to walk or bike or take transit. I am pleased that just last week, we opened Nashville's second complete street, the 28th and 31st Avenue connector, which connects North Nashville to West Nashville, helping us to fix a divide created in our community when the interstate was built decades ago. If you have not been on the connector, I invite you to visit it as it was designed to accommodate all forms of transportation, not only cars, but pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit. And in addition to economic benefits, this complete street also has environmental benefits and most importantly, social benefits through a greener sense of community. Another large project having a positive impact on the health of vitality in our city is riverfront redevelopment. This past spring, we opened the new park, Cumberland Park, on the east bank next to the pedestrian bridge. And as we continue redevelopment on both the east and west banks of the Cumberland River, we plan to turn the river from a natural asset to view to a place for recreation. In partnership with Nash Vitality, we are also implementing an expanded bike share program. Right now, community members and visitors can borrow a bike from 10 different locations across the city at no cost through a program called Nashville Green Bikes. These locations are directly linked to 94 miles of greenways and 133 miles of on-road bike lanes and shared use bike routes. And we will be expanding the bike share program this year with a kiosk-based bike rental system called Nashville B-Cycle, which will be located primarily in the downtown urban core. In addition to the bike share program this year, we launched the 30 mile Music City Bikeway, which is a continuous bicycle route that takes you from Percy Warner Park on one side of the county to Percy Priest Dam on the other. As mayor, I recognize that to really make a dent in our city's obesity rate, it's not enough just to build infrastructure. We have to help inspire our citizens to embrace a new way of living where being healthy and active is something they choose to do every single day. And this is why it's important to me to take an active role in motivating a healthy culture through education programs and events which help shape a city's healthy lifestyle. There are currently three health initiatives that um, we are challenging our community to accomplish. Last week at the start of Walk Nashville Week, we relaunched the Walk 100 Miles with the Mayor's Citywide Health Challenge. I'm asking all Nashvilleians to join me over the next three months through the end of 2012 to walk 100 miles. To register, you just go to the website, which is walk100miles.com, where you can register and view the list of events and log on and track your miles. At the end of the Walk 100 Miles campaign, participants uh, will get a uh, free t-shirt. And we've got to think of something for people who have done the earlier Walk 100 and the second Walk 100 to commemorate those who do 200. For this Walk 100 Mile Challenge, uh, we'll be Go, doing walks through neighborhoods, parks and greenways, and other locations three to four times a month to encourage community participation and help participants reach their 100-mile goal. But with this round, I'm encouraging local businesses, schools, community organizations, and groups to organize walks as well. 
and then we want you to invite my office to participate so we can make it an official event. You can find a walk with the mayor request form on the 100 mile website. We also have the second annual uh, 5K walk run coming up on Sunday, November 18th. The Titans are not in town, so there's no excuse. Um, this, this will be free. It's open to all ages and fitness levels. It's a walk, it's a run, it's whatever you want it to be. It's not a race. Um, and this year we've added a kids run or, or walk, which will be 0.75 miles. Um, with uh, for kids 12 and under and this event uh, last year we had 5,000 this year we'd love to get 7,000 you can go online and register at that at mayor's challenge 5k and the last challenge has to do with the workplace I feel that it's important to shape a healthy environment where we spend a large portion of our day and that's at work every day more than 400,000 Nashvilleans go to a place of work and many of us spend more uh, waking hours at work than anywhere else and as a result our workplaces are more than just economic drivers they are critical in shaping how we live and because of that this spring we launched the workplace challenge which encourages people to be to look at how they can help the environment live healthier and also volunteer if you haven't signed up for the workplace challenge please go to the web page and sign up um, and then also sign up for the other health initiatives we have our quality of life is largely determined by our communities, where we live, work, learn, worship, and play. I firmly believe that every day we need to be taking a step closer to fighting the obesity epidemic here in Nashville and a step toward winning. Nashville is a natural leader in this area. This is a center of health, this is a center of, of universities, and this is a beautiful part of the country with lots of, lots of greenways and great parks. I know we can accomplish this goal because Nashville is in truly a special place and it's with the help and the knowledge of groups like the Nashville Civic Design Center that Nashville is able to achieve the goals of making our community a better and healthier place. Thank you all for being here and supporting this great organization. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just uh, want to also mention Jason Holloman's here, so a uh, council person that came in that wasn't mentioned earlier. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Chase Rand, who is also the co-chair for this event. Uh, many of you know Chase from his very successful tenure here as the first director of the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. Chase left Nashville almost 10 years ago to move to Washington, D.C. to become the director of the National Building Museum the preeminent institution in the country devoted to architecture and design. I had the pleasure of sitting next to Chase last night at dinner, and uh, it was wonderful hearing all the great things that he's doing uh, in D.C., but also representing architecture and design across the country. And Chase, uh, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to follow up with you on uh, making sure I come to D.C. and that everybody up there knows all the great work we're doing here, too. So uh, please help me welcome Chase. Thank you, Gary, and hello, Nashville. It's, it's, I'm so pleased to be back. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm delighted to be back in Nashville, both of you. Um, I first wanted to start off by thanking my good friend and co-chair, Donna Glassford, for giving me this great excuse to get back here to Nashville. So thank you, Donna. And I want to congratulate Julia, Gary, and everybody else who's associated with the Nashville Civic Design Center for the great work that you're doing. Um, I was actually here in Nashville when the idea of the center was birthed and got to watch it uh, uh, formed and start. And I actually attended a couple of the early charrettes and it's just great to see the progress that's been made uh, in the years uh, since. Um, I was really delighted to be asked to introduce today's speaker because uh, our work at the National Building Museum is so closely connected to his in many ways. I'm the director of the only museum on the planet that is dedicated to exploring and elucidating every uh, one of the building arts and sciences. So through our exhibitions and through our programs, uh, we uh, educate our visitors about such issues as design, engineering technologies, innovative materials, and urban planning. We have a long-standing commitment to 
uh, issues of sustainability to public policies associated with the built environment and with green and healthy communities. So as you can see, we have uh, a great connection with our keynote speaker. We have long admired Dr. Jackson's work in these arenas and I'm honored to have finally met him last evening. Dr. Richard Jackson's credentials are formidable. I will not take the time to go over all of them. I can tell you that he, uh, he is a pediatrician. He's the former director of the Center for uh, Disease Control Center for Environmental Health and is currently chair of environmental health sciences at the School of uh, Public Health at UCLA. Now, this is a man whose accomplishments have been acknowledged by many organizations with numerous accolades and awards. Most recently, in fact, just uh, about a month ago, it was announced that Dr. Jackson is one of only five outstanding individuals to receive a Heinz Award from the Heinz Family Foundation for his work related to the environment. There are few honors that are more prestigious than that, and I congratulate you, Doctor. I um, recently had the opportunity to read about him as well as to chat with him, and uh, his is a fascinating life story. He's a great example of what growing up in a nurturing environment can yield. In his youth, he learned to admire intellect and to love our natural world. And he learned that facts and data are useful tools that only become meaningful when mixed with heavy doses of compassion and regard for our fellow man. Dr. Jackson writes about caring, and boy does he care. He cares about the health of our planet and the quality of life we are leaving for generations to come. He cares and he does something about it. As noted by the Heinz Foundation, Dr. Jackson, Jackson has sparked a national conversation about the relationship between the physical design of communities and rising health risks, particularly to our children. As one of his colleagues noted, Dr. Jackson is a public health evangelist, and we ignore his message at our peril. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Richard Jackson. Th thank you, Chase. And uh, I was sitting over there thinking, wow, would public health in this country be easier if um, Carl Dean was mayor of every city and town in the United States. That was a wonderful public health talk. And um, I'll talk more about the built environment. Some of you have heard some of this, but we'll, we'll go through it. Uh, the book on the... The bigger book is Making Healthy Places, the one I use as a textbook at the School of Public Health. It's heavily referenced, it's mildly boring, um, and it's what the students have to memorize. One of the hardest parts is forcing all the public health students to learn Plannerese language, and it's not acceptable for them to not know what multimodal services are. And on the other hand, uh, they, the planners have to learn what public health language is, and they keep talking about morbidity and mortality. Instead of saying morbidity and mortality, they say death and sickness, and they have to learn all the real words. So, um, but there's a larger point about crossing between the two domains. And one of my big themes is the 20th century is over. We solve problems in the 20th century by breaking them down and making them more atomized and smaller and smaller. We could solve them when they got really tiny. But I think the struggles and the things we're looking at as we go into the future are much broader. The other book, Designing Healthy Communities, is the companion book for the video series. And I have a favorite ask of Nashville, which is it's basically shown all four hours several times around the country. But Nashville, I believe, has only shown one hour of it. So that's a favor I have. And is anybody here born on October 12th, the birth date of my grandchild? My first grandchild? Nobody wants to admit? OK. This is a gift. Thank you. <laughs> On October 12th, this particular advertisement appeared, half-page ad, in all the university newspapers in the country. And the point of the ad, you know, General Motors had done focus group testing and had 
ask young people, college age, what was a message that really resonated with you? And after a lot of analysis, I can imagine them on the other side of the window, a mirror there, and reality sucks. Young people really resonating with that message, and it's not the message we really wanted, but GM was going to help fix this uh, if you went out and bought a $30,000 GMC Sierra, uh, took the next seven years paying for it, you would be much happier. Um, and down at the bottom says, stop pedaling, start driving. Well, I was pretty upset by this, and I, I and about a thousand other people wrote grumpy notes to GM, and they pulled the ad that day. But I was looking, I was saying, showing it to my students and saying, look, they've got this pretty girl smirking at the guy who's doing what we want. He's exercising, not polluting, not adding to congestion. And I showed it to my students. Said, Dr. J, she's not smirking at him. She's flirting with him. She doesn't want to be with the chubby guy driving the car. <laughs> but you know, GM uh, was on to something. In fact, we've seen a fourfold increase in the use of antidepressants in the prime of life just over the last 20 years. There's medical reasons why it's, but this is a very prevalent disorder in America. And towards the end, I'll talk about the best way to reverse depression, mild to moderate depression, is being with people you love, being active, um, and being engaged in community. The mayor had talked about Tennessee data, but it just uh, I had done my homework, and wonderful news, you've dropped from 30 packs to uh, 20, um, or, 30% smoking to 20% smoking in the state over the last dozen or so years. Uh, the data for obesity is pretty scary. I mean, that's a very short period of time to go from 10 to 32% of the population. Um, with obesity and diabetes, the disease that costs 2% of the entire GDP of the United States at this point is going, has gone from about 6% up to 12%, double in a young person's lifetime. I mean, this is very, very rapid in any way. When I was young, we thought 7% of, of all the money in the country going to medical care was a lot of money. We're now up to 19% of all the money in the United States going to medical care. And this is before we begin to harvest the fact that we've doubled diabetes, because it's a very expensive disease to manage. Uh, my son was, we, he's now a physician at CDC, but Years ago, we sent him to Costa Rica to you know, learn community and Spanish and a bunch of other things. And he t emailed me one day and said, you know, they spend seven times less on medical care than we do in the United States. And they live exactly as long as we do. And he was really impressed that the public health measures, the immunization measures, the clean water, the clean air, and the other issues they were putting in place were having real positive impacts on the health of people in Costa Rica. In, 19, in the year 1999, I had been at CDC for about five years, and I was, you know, National Center for Environmental Health, I was worried about PCBs and DDT and chemicals in the body and endocrine disruptor chemicals and declining sperm counts and a whole series of micro issues, and I was worried about global climate change and, you know, heating of the planet and big issues at a distance, and I'm driving down Buford Highway in Atlanta, Georgia, and you've probably been on this road, my offices were there, it's seven lanes wide, um, and it's lined on each side by the homes of the poor. Uh, double, uh, two and three story garden apartments, essentially filled with immigrants and poor people. Two miles between um, crosswalks at certain parts. People going along at 55, 60 miles an hour. Highest pedestrian death rate in the state of Georgia, which has a pretty high pedestrian death rate. And when you'd pick up the newspaper and you'd look at the story about Jay Walker, killed on Buford Highway, it didn't say mother of three trying to get across the street to get downtown, to get to work, didn't have time at eight o'clock in the morning to walk a mile to the crosswalk to get to the other side. So I looked over to the side of the road and here's an elderly woman walking along, struggling in the heat, bent over with a shopping bag, one in each hand. She's got red hair, she looks like my mother and I want to stop and give her a ride. I don't do it, I go to my meeting and we're all talking about these big distant issues and I'm thinking, that poor woman collapses, the cause of death will be heat stroke and it won't be heat island effects, absence of trees and absence of public transportation. And if she's hit by a truck going by, the cause of death will be motor vehicle trauma and it won't be lack of, public, lack of sidewalks, lack of public transportation, poor urban planning and failed political leadership. And what this is about, 
is the causes of the causes of death. In public health, we doctors have got, have got to stop sitting at the end of the disease pipeline, seeing five, six, seven people a day with high blood sugars, high blood pressure, too much overweight, and we have to move upstream and intervene at the cause of these disorders. But guess what? When you show up at the Planning Commission, the Transportation Commission, the Department of Agriculture, and say, hey, you've got to change what you're doing, they say, go away, doc. You don't know what you're talking about. We know how to manage transportation in our state. So it, I was state health officer in California. We pushed very hard to have health in all policies, and the governor agreed to a strategic growth council that really brought these various partners together. At that meeting at CDC, we decided on the 10 leading causes of death in the 21st century. Half a dozen of them, I will argue, have their origin in how we build the environments we live in. Human beings are so adaptable, we scarcely notice where we are. We think it has to be this way, um, you know, to walk a mile and a half to get to a crosswalk. We uh, constructed about two to three million of the structures in the upper hand, left hand side of that picture and the message, by the way, our affordable housing policy in the United States after World War II was, real estate people, drive until you qualify. And so, over and over again, we said, well, the American dream is a distant house with a picket fence. As George Carlin once said, it's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. Because um, to, to get to these homes, you're, you're spending, in the beginning it was 15 minutes, now it's 45 minutes to an hour on congested roads to get there, and you're wondering why you're white-knuckled and stressed. In Los Angeles, if you ask the average Los Angeles, you know, I don't know about your city, what the most stressful part of their day is, they always say, it's my commute. It's not my job or, or whatever. When I was a kid, they, they opened Disneyland in 1955. I watched it on television. It was great, Frontierland, Tomorrowland. I thought, wow, I want to go there. That, that's cool. And uh, they had five cars on Highway 5 at the time. Um, everybody in the country decided they wanted to be in a place with free highways and no congestion. Uh, it didn't work after everyone had the same idea. And one of the things I teach my students, and this is, I'm, I'm very serious about this, the built environment is social policy in concrete. So the city of Syracuse, and in this video series we visited about a dozen cities around the country, Syracuse, the east side of the highway, was mainly more affluent white folks with the hospitals, and the west side was poorer folks, mainly minorities. After the highway went through cutting the t city in half, what happened to the poor side of town? The, it was very hard to get to work on the other side. The supermarkets disappeared. There was one left, and we showcased that. But now there's serious discussion about removing this cleaving right through the heart of, of Syracuse and rebuilding the city, having the highway go around the city as a, a view towards the future. Social policy in concrete. Northwest Atlanta didn't want the MARTA to go up there. It brought in the wrong element. And now uh, God's punishing them because they're sitting in traffic four hours a day, um, even if they have 23 lanes. The more we drive, the worse the air quality. Uh, the worse the air quality in LA, and I admit this is LA, we, at the, by the time we kids finish high school, we're seeing three times higher the rate of asthma in high air pollution areas versus low air pollution areas. And Dr. Sullivan was telling me this morning that Nashville's got quite high area, uh, rates of, of asthma as well, for issues of fungus, river bottom, but also uh, air pollution as well. The mayor had already talked about um, uh, the obesity epidemic Perhaps you've all seen this, but one of the things I teach my students is the one thing you have to learn in public health school, A, is how to tell a story to an elected leader because they all value stories as coin of the realm. But number two, every elected leader understands maps better than the average epidemiologist, I guarantee you. <laughs> and you've got to be able to present your information in the form of a map, so I've cut this down to very brief, but here's the map in 1991, uh, Tennessee at about 10 to 14 percent. And this is frozen on me. Um, and there is Tennessee jumped 15 years ahead, over 30% of the population. So we've seen a dramatic shift. The average American has gained about 25 pounds in 25 years. Watch the movies from the 1970s. Everybody looks 
skinny by comparison you know, compared to ourselves now. Average 14 year olds about 14 pounds heavier during that same period of time. Next slide, please. We build places that make it hard to walk from one place to another. If you live at the top of that cul-de-sac, um, you'd have to climb over a fence and pass a Doberman and a Rottweiler to get your best friend's house uh, on the other. And you have the other alternative, just getting in the car and being driven everywhere. But the thing I'm driving at here is our kids are driven everywhere much too much, and we've removed autonomy from their lives. I won't ask you to raise your hands. I will, actually. How many of you, when you were a kid, went out on Saturday morning and did not come home until it got dark outside? How many of your kids or grandchildren can do that? And it's not simply because we have television stations that scare us to death with stories of snatched children. I think we've created physical environments that make it scary for people to have kids on their own. Next. Average American, in my opinion, unless you live out in a remote country area, ought to be able to buy a carton of milk without getting in a car. Ought to be able to walk or bike to buy a carton of milk. In Europe, more than half the population can do that. Northern Europe, only about 7% of us can do it here in the United States. Look what's happened to kids walking and biking to school. We've gone from two-thirds of them in one generation to about one in eight. And you know, there are social reasons we created big box schools and deferred. These big box schools are cheaper because they're on cheap land. They're way outside of town. You reduce the number of you know, vice principals and, and janitors. But the truth is that um, it makes it hard for parents because parents now are doing a lot of the hauling instead of the kids' feet doing the work. And look what's happened to the fitness of our children. Every state, I believe, ought to have the equivalent of a fitness gram on the report card, ought to be able to demonstrate the kids, among other things, can run, walk a 12-minute mile. Half the people in this room, I'm sure, could run, walk a 12-minute mile. And three quarters of our kids in my state, and, you, and I'm sure yours is about the same, cannot do that. It's so significant that um, two out of every seven volunteers for the US military at this point cannot get in because of obesity and lack of fitness. Sorry, it's a technical slide, but the quick version of this technical slide is the more our weight goes up, the more our risk of becoming diabetic goes up. So my body mass index is about 27, 28. I have four times the risk I would have if I were skinny. I'd like to be skinny again. Um, and about 15 times the risk if I were a woman. If you're borderline morbidly obese, almost 100 times the risk for a woman. So you can imagine with these maps changing for obesity that the maps for diabetes are going to change at the same time. Here's 1994 and the maps for uh, diabetes. Uh, Tennessee at about 5% or so next. And I've jumped to 2007. Tennessee over 10%. And I showed you the earlier numbers. The, the cost, of, we've only begun to harvest the effects of this. But this is the stat. This came out at the President's Council on the Obesity Epidemic about two, three months ago. We're now looking at, by the year 2030, 11% of all the people in the United States having body mass indexes over 40, which is 100 pounds overweight. And if you think the medical community can deal with that, you're wrong. There's no way we're going to turn this around with medicines. We've got to begin to think about other upstream interventions. The other big issue, and everyone should, who has been out of high school or college ought to know what the killing curve. I know this is um, politically dangerous for me to be walking here, but this is CO2 of planet Earth in my lifetime. It's gone from 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million in my lifetime in the atmosphere. Any doctor that ignores a patient returning CO2 is guilty of malpractice. We've seen major changes in our climate. So Nashville has gone from having the, the you know, was cooler than Atlanta, and now go to the next one, that's 1990. By 2006, um, we've now got the climate, we now have the climate of Atlanta from 16 years ago, and Atlanta's got the climate of Charleston and Florida in 16 years. Next. The Weather Bureau has been taking weather measurements for 118 years, six to 10 times a day, averaged them out across the country, all the places, and all the states. And these are the, the red ones are the hottest 
winter spring in the history of the United States in those states. And you can see 117 years and further on. So whether or not you agree with humans causing this, I, I, I'm open to an argument on that. Whether this is serious, um, it's absolutely serious. It's going to change the physical construct of the environment we're in. When you put more energy in the atmosphere, you have more violent storms. When you put more heat in the atmosphere, you have more moisture in the atmosphere. The storms are more violent. Um, this is a report that came out this morning. These reinsurance companies are not a bunch of screaming liberals, and they're saying we're worried about the impact of these climate changes going forward. Munich Re, next. And the generals of the United States, including Tony Zinni, the commandant of the Marine Corps, is saying this will completely change force readiness and how we're going to wage uh, defense in the United States going into the future. So enough depressing. Uh, let's talk about solutions. Next, please. So I was state health officer. Uh, I interviewed in Governor Schwarzenegger's office in 2004. They said, what are your priorities? And I said, number one is terrorism preparedness. And number three was the infrastructure of public health. But number two was the obesity epidemic. And I could just see the governor thinking, obesity, that's a, that's a personal decision. And the argument I had to make is, no, we're completely shaped by the environments we are in. Both the physical and the social, and the advertising and the price environments that we are in are shaping these decisions. And the purpose of public health, Governor, is to give people conditions where they can be healthy. Um, one of the things, this is on the west steps of the Capitol when I was a Secret Service guard, and, um, <laughs> but it, what it was really about was the fact that we spend, we the Americans spend $14 billion in price supports a year for corn, soy, and about four other commodity crops. And we spend nothing for price supports for the things that are good for us. So what's happened is stuff that we don't need to eat, lots of calories, lots of sugars, uh, et cetera, have become um, twice as uh, inexpensive, and the th things that we do need to eat um, have become twice as expensive. Uh, fruits and vegetables become twice as expensive. And we need to convince every kid in America that if you eat food spelled backwards, you're a doofus. <laughs> I know this is going to be unpopular, and people don't like taxes, and you can call it a fee, but we don't want people to drink too much alcohol. We put a tax on that. We put a tax on tobacco, or at least nicotine. Um, a penny a teaspoon is not going to ruin anybody. Your soda cup can go from a buck and a quarter to a buck 35 if you can afford it. I bet you can afford the buck 35 better than you can afford 12 teaspoons of sugar dumping into your pancreas and to your uh, abdomen at the same time. And you know, it'll raise money. I'm not sure it'll really dec decrease anybody's sugar consumption. And we ought to use that money. And this is a big theme of what I want to say. This is about kids. This is about the world we're creating for our children and the world going future. We, you know, we're not going to do much to change my health or most people's my age's health at this point. It's a little medical stuff. But the trajectory we are setting our kids on is extremely worrisome and it ought to be a healthful trajectory at the same time. We absolutely need arts and culture at the beginning of every intervention program. It's how do we create places and themes that are really fun. This is in San Antonio. Um, my students did a project on stadiums, and I, I don't mean to tease you too much, but um, stadiums are always sold as a way to give a heart and culture to a community, and I, I think that's great, but I'm going to compare two of them next. One is Safeco Field, where it was isolated in Seattle, and there is no housing, no transit around it. Um, the city spent $440 million on it. They've recouped, in tax dollars, they've recouped $40 million over the last few years. It's not been a great investment. Um, Next, this is Pac Bell Field in San Francisco. This was a depressing, scary part of town, of San Francisco, south of markets, where the poor lived. And what they did was, if they cleared 100 poor families off the block to build, there were 100 affordable families that went, and that families mainly, went back in there after they put in market rate housing in the same place. Pacific Bell Park has transit from, has BART, has Caltrain, it has local transit, has wonderful walkability. Look at this next slide. Uh, only 4,000 parking spaces haven't had an empty seat in 140 games. Do you think that helps the competitiveness in the National League to have that kind of revenue and, and heart for that community? It really has become a heart for the community. It's not isolated, it's in the community. 
we need to create neighborhoods that are easy for all. Somehow in America, we forgot the difference between streets and roads. Streets are for people, all people, young, old, disabled, rich, poor, uh, walking, biking, and whatever way we need to get around. Roads were for vehicles, but somehow transportation decided that all of our streets were going to be roads. And I commend the mayor and I commend the city for really your living streets policy. And the leading cause of death from 3 to 34 is car crashes. And the best way to mitigate car crashes, or at least deaths, is to slow down. If you're hit by a vehicle going 20, you have a 5% chance of dying. If you're hit by a vehicle going 30, a 45% chance of dying. I'm running a big campaign on the UCLA campus to really traffic calm the campus. And people say, well, it'll slow us down from getting to the top of the campus to the bottom of the campus. I calculate it's 27 seconds difference between 30 miles an hour and 20 miles an hour. Looks boring. This is the policy statement of the American Academy of Pediatrics, who, who tells you how many immunizations you should get and how you deal with nutritional issues for babies. This is their policy statement saying, kids need to grow up in neighborhoods with increasing autonomy, increasing life challenges. And I visited Tara's beautiful park down by the bottoms there uh, yesterday, and we talked about how children need to have safe risks in their lives. There are schools that are cutting off the lower limbs on trees, so we don't want kids to climb trees. Primates have been climbing trees for a million years, but we don't want kids climbing trees. Children have to, and they need a little bit of risk. You don't want them to get badly hurt, but it's okay to fall and skin your knees so you'll learn about gravity and, and that what can hurt you. <laughs> By the way, this overprotection of kids means that a lot of kids sit in the back of the car until they're 16 years, 364 days old, and the next day they're handed keys to the car, and that's an awfully quick transition from um, non-autonomy to autonomy. Exercise, the safest treatment for depression. And if you do exercise outdoors in green spaces, it's even more effective in raising serotonin and lowering rates of depression. I loved walking along your river, and I really want to commend the, the wonderful leadership. And when I asked permission of the mother of these two children to take their picture climbing the wall, I think it's Cumberland, is that it? Um, and the mother said, oh yeah, I love this. We come here all the time. And the, the child on the right is a boy. And, and at first I thought it was a girl. I was a little embarrassed. And um, I said, can I take a picture? Yes. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how kids being active really helps. And she said, oh yeah, it really helps. He was taking Adderall, which is a pretty heavy duty uh, ADHD drug, and even second grade and third grade. And finally she said, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm just going to have him run around all day long and exercise. And you know, it works better than the medicine. And I'm not saying all kids shouldn't do it, but you know, do the least harm you can when you're looking for treatments. And you always go for the benign one first. Get daylight. Somewhere in 1960, they decided kids would learn best in classrooms with no windows. Can you imagine anything more stupid in your life? I'm sorry. You know, they're supposed to be teaching and they're putting no windows. Well, now there's data that shows that actually kids learn better and behave better if there's windows and daylight and actually green space to look at while they're learning. Um, it's interesting because the daylight saturation makes reading much easier. Fluorescent lights make it harder for kids to concentrate because kids can hear the, the buzz. I can't, but the kids can hear it. And they actually find that children learn better and behave better with daylighting. And this goes really, I was talking to climate change. You know, it's ridiculous to be burning fossil fuels when God's sending photons and putting them on the roof. We need to figure out ways to um, illuminate and heat our homes. I want to commend the wonderful bike routes. I took a picture with, um, as we were going around town yesterday, this is just lovely. In the, Wall, next please, uh, along there is, is great as well. I saw how the bike route bent around. I was a little nervous on this next turn. I was afraid to uh, ask to have the car slowed down, but there was a bike painted flat on the road in the middle lane, and I wasn't sure that I would want my 16-year-old bicycling there. Thank you very much. I'm teasing a little bit, but um, I actually do think that sharrows are a bit, th these are called sharrows. They're a little bit delusional, and we really probably ought to be painting green lanes that really make it and demark where people can be biking safely. 
This is Washington, D.C. You come out, and, and I think it's great that you're putting the bike exchange and the B, B Nashville B bike um, exchange. It's, it's terrific. This uh, picture, I happened to notice that the police officers were on police vehicles, and they were parked uh, near Union Station in Washington, D.C. Um, one of the vehicles, I thought, gee, I wonder what they cost. I wonder how many calories you burn on each one. Next. Turns out, they, one costs 10 times as much as the other, and um, they burn about three times as much calories on the mountain bike as they do standing on the Segway. Um, but it's sort of a metaphor. Sometimes we have uh, mechanical fixes for when, in fact, using our bodies would work perfectly well. I did get some smile out of the fact the police officers on the Segways were chubbier than the other police <laughs> officer. Let's, let's skip that, please. Um, if you start exercising even at midlife, you add, it's as good as stopping smoking. It adds about six to eight years of life. Next. This is the report of the National Academy of Sciences. It looks boring, and I tell my students, anything that sounds boring is important, like you know, the Office of Management and Budget and the Senate Rules Committee and things like that. Um, this is the Institute of Medicine recommending how we're going to turn around the obesity epidemic. You'd think, oh, they're going to talk about food first. Goal one, strategy one, was to build an America where people can be physically fit. They didn't even take on the obesity thing first. They said, do what you're doing in Nashville. Skip that. Um, New York City now mandates that all new buildings have pleasant, attractive stairways. You're not forced to get on an elevator the minute you walk into a building. One flight of stairs a day for a year is about a pound of body weight. You know, it's good exercise. It helps your balance. It helps you uh, be physically fit. They also mandate energy efficient buildings, sturdy buildings that will stand up to heavier weather in the 21st century, and good daylighting. Kaiser Permanente has been running a campaign to tell people to take the stairs. They just did it without talking to their safety people. Next slide, please. <laughs> What do insurance companies call disasters? Accelerated depreciation. And I would assert that every city ought to have a plan for how, and I know you did this in Nashville, but how you're going to rebuild as smart as you can um, to put in those public places, to put in the things that you really want. Because after the disaster, the window opens and the money comes in, it's the time. So Daniel Burnham, the man, the father of lots of architecture in the United States, had a plan for San Francisco back in the 1890s for when the earthquake occurred and how they would rebuild San Francisco. Light rail and bus message rapid transit is probably as good. This is what happened in Charlotte in 2007. They were doing health studies of people there before and after the light rail went in. Um, people started taking the light rail, about half the population. The people taking light rail started to meet. They were doing it to save money, to read a book, to meet their neighbors, to have less stress in their lives. And they discovered they were meeting the Surgeon General's guidelines for physical activity. And not only that, on average, after a year or so, they lost six and a half pounds. Now, we've gained more than six and a half pounds, but everybody in America lost six and a half pounds. We'd be saving some money, and we'd be moving in the right direction. Seoul, South Korea. Would you like to have a cup of coffee sitting by the Chinoge Freeway in Seoul? $900 million. They ripped it out, and they unroofed the river. You don't, doctors don't need to wag their finger at people and tell them to be physically active, to go for a walk and not be depressed when you're living near a place. People want to be near water. They not only want green space and walking, they want to be near water. And kids especially cannot resist it. And it's a place of the heart day and night. Next. So all the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts in town have done these kind of stencils. Well, I would like to recommend, Mr. Mayor, that you invest in a whole bunch of new stencils So with this, let me stop. And really, um, congratulations. You're doing, this is such an amazing city. And the changes I've seen in five years have been terrific. And take that right hand and go like this, because you all deserve a real pat in the back. Congratulations for the great work you did.
Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you, everyone who came. I'd like to do thank yous a tad bit backwards. Um, going to start with everyone in the audience. Many of you have supported us financially. And more importantly, you support our programs and participate in our programs. And most importantly, you contribute extensively to all the many fabrics of our city, to the lifestyle, to the livability, to the quality of design, to the many facets and access and components that make Nashville the great city that it is. The Civic Design Center has been doing a research project over the past 18 months in the interface between health and the built environment. And it is breathtaking to see the many ways that our lives are touched by health and the many ways that those components are touched by design. Thank you all for the work you do. I'd like to thank uh, Chase Rind for coming and being a part of it. We had a great meeting this morning. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Jackson for coming. And even though it was really depressing, I'd like you all to know that he is actually going straight to the airport because he's awarded the Heinz Award um, in the morning, or I believe tomorrow. And so if you all wanted to stay and eat your dessert, you're more than welcome to. And I won't tell him. Uh, I think we're in close to 1 o'clock. And I'd like to set you all free to go back and do what you do best. And thank you again for coming. I hope to see you next year. <laughs>